Yay Networks. Hey, y'all. Welcome to Life with the Lindsay's. My name is Heather. And what's up, y'all? It's your boy Cornelius. Yes, I'm so excited you landed on our podcast, and your life is pretty much going to be changed. Yes, man. If you're looking for something real relevant and authentic, then you landed on the right place. Hey, here's the thing. We're about to get going right now, so y'all tune in, buckle up, sit back, get ready for the show. Here we go. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy Cornelius. Happy to be with you with another episode, yo. Yo. Keep throwing this out there to y'all. Some change is going to be coming. You'll see them. Probably like, when are they going to start happening? Just just, just, just be there. I just want to make sure that, you know, I continue to let y'all know because, you know, I don't want, I don't want like something to happen and then y'all like, oh my goodness, something changed. And I know the change could be a bit difficult for certain people, especially when they don't know about the change. And especially for those individuals who have trauma as it relates to change, because you've had, you know, so much change in your life, it, it kind of gives you a, a brief sense of anxiety. And so I want to be able to, you know, consistently remind you that there's a change that is coming so that when it does come, uh, it won't bring you any, any, uh, any sense of anxiety. But I wanted to be able to, uh, to kind of continue on this pathway of, um, of healing and be able to just kind of walk you down this journey that I've been walking down myself. And so that's why I have been, you know, taking some time to, you know, to just kind of sit here with you and be able to share some things with you. So I hope that the last three or four weeks, whatever it's been, I hope that it has been encouraging for you. I hope that you're being able to get something out of it. I hope that it's been, you know, a light for your own soul. And when I say light, um, I'm meaning in all of the symbolic representation, that light is symbolic of enlightenment, like in, in the tabernacle, in the tent of meeting, when God told Moses to build this, this tabernacle, this moving uh, dwelling place, God had Abraham to put the menorah, or he, or we also refer to it as the golden candlestick, uh, inside of the holy place. And it's very interesting because in the tabernacle you had the outer, you had the outer court, you had the inner court, and you had the holies of holies. Or better yet, you had the outer court, you also had the holy place, and then you had the holies of holies. And so, the outer court was illuminated by by the light of the sun. And when the priest went to the holy place, since he went inside of the tent. When he goes inside the holy place, then the holy place is illuminated by the by the uh, the golden candlestick or the menorah. So the golden candlestick, it wasn't the only thing that was in the holy place because you also had like the table of showbread and then you know you had the incense. But that the the, um, the golden candlestick or or the menorah here, it it represents enlightenment. That's what light does. When light comes into a place, when light you know when when you turn on the light, it dispels darkness. It dispels ignorance. It allows for you to come to a place of knowing. And so the golden, the golden candlestick, the menorah, the light is symbolic of, of acknowledgement. It's symbolic of admittance. It's symbolic of understanding. It's symbolic of knowing. It means that you have been enlightened. And now that you are enlightened, now you can live differently or you can think differently or you can make different choices because you are enlightened. And that is what enlightenment does. So when I say I hope that you have been enlightened, I hope that it has pressed something on the inside of you or changed something inside of you or changed the way that you thought or even, you know, put you on your own pathway towards healing and, and towards confession and towards understanding and, you know, whatever it is in your personal life that you have to make amends for. I pray that it's done that. Uh, most importantly, I hope that one thing that you've heard about this is that you've heard in these talks that we've had, I hope that you've, you've, you really understood that it, this has to come from a very personal place. You know, it's crazy. Cause I don't know if, I don't know if you've ever done this. I've done this before where I'm sitting down in, I'm sitting down in a church, I'm sitting down somewhere and I'm listening to somebody speak. And when I'm listening to them, the one, you know, most prevalent thought going through my, my head is I know who needs to hear this. I know somebody who needs to hear this, like Jack could really hear this or, you know, Susie should really hear this. or This person should really hear this because it could really help them. And because I'm so because, you know, I can be so other centric or so others focused and thinking about what they need to hear that I don't take the time to listen for myself. And I'm not asking you to be self-centered. I'm not asking you to be self-centric. I'm asking you to do what I talked about last time, and that is to have your own sense of consciousness, meaning that you're able to step outside of yourself long enough to really see yourself, you know, in, in its truest reality, in, its, in, in your truest form. 
It is you standing outside of yourself so that you can look without judging. Is you being able to make inventory, personal inventory of, you know, for yourself. And that is void or absent of excuses for anybody else. And this is the reason why I am this way, or, or this is why this happened, or this is why I have this fear, or this is why I can't forgive, or this is why I can't do that. No, it's you being able to step back and being conscious enough to say, I, I have unforgiveness and, you know, and, and still embedded within me. I have a lot of anger embedded within me. I'm a very selfish person or I am this, I am that, you know, we, we all want to be great people, but you know, if, if, I mean, if you're a piece of crap, you just got to call, you got to call yourself on the carpet. You're a piece of crap. Even when I write down in my journal, I, some of the things I wrote down in the very beginning was that, you know, you're, you're a piece of crap, you know, and, and some of the things that you've done, some of the things you said, and when you can finally be that observant with yourself and be conscious enough, I think that's a place where, you know, the process of healing can, can begin to start. But if you never arrive at that place of consciousness, then you really don't have an understanding of where you need to make the change because it's really never about you, right? Like it's not, it's not about you at that point. It's now it's about somebody else. It's about the place where somebody else needs to make the change. It's about, you know, seeing them do whatever it is that needs to be done so they can make the change. And, and this is you being able to sit down and say, no, this is the area where I need to change. It is you making your own personal inventory. This is where I am. This is where I am. This is where I need to change. This is, this is the path. And I cannot move forward until I come to acknowledge where I am outside of every excuse that makes me believe where I am. So it's no longer me saying, well, I am this way because, you know, I didn't have this, which could be an extremely valid reason. This is not what this is at this point. It is being able to be conscious enough to know exactly where you are. And one of the places where that really stuck me for a while, and I wrote about this, I wrote about this. It took me about two and a half days to get my full thoughts out in my journal about this. But it was the constant thought of just not feeling good enough, just not feeling good enough. And I understand the foundational place or the, the root of where this comes from, you know, the lack of affirmation from, from my childhood and stuff like that, you know, being able to, to go back and pinpoint certain places where, you know, I never felt like I measured up. I never measured up enough. You know, I never got that attention that I wanted. So I always had to prove myself. It was almost like Everything I was doing was just kind of proving myself. You know, when I was in uh, high school, I was president of, of every extracurricular activity, every, every extracurricular club you can think about, president of the future business leaders of America, president of the future farmers of America, president of Key Club. I was president of Beta Club. I was president of National Honor Society, president of National Technical Honor Society. And then, you know, I'm on the dean's list. And you know, I always felt like I needed to measure up. I was in AP classes. I always felt like I just needed to measure up. I needed to be in the top 10 of my graduating class of, you know, 300 some odd kids. I needed to, I need to be at the top. I needed to be, I need to be the guy. I was, I was, you know, elected class president my sophomore year, my junior year and my senior year of high school. It was always me wanting to be at the top, wanting to be at the top because I, I wanted to, I wanted, I wanted to know, did I belong? I mentioned Brene Brown in one of one of the talks I just gave, and uh, I've, I've read you know in all of her books. I, I think if she has any more, it just came out. But one of the things she talks about is this idea of belonging, because we all want to belong, and before we can belong everywhere, we have to understand that we really belong nowhere. And that first, if we're going to belong with others, we have to know that we belong to ourselves that I have a sense of belonging for me and my belonging, the way that I saw it was I want to belong somewhere, but it was always other centric. It was always like, where do I fit in? What group of people do I fit in? What labels do I, do I put on? Do, do I fit in with when in my consciousness, I can step back and say, you know what, God, the reason why it's so difficult for me to find belonging outside of myself is because I don't feel like I belong I don't belong to myself. 
And then on top of that, I don't feel like I belong with you. And now the word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. You know, I've, I've, I've had to take the, those steps towards, you know, getting the, the therapeutic treatments and getting the help that I need, which is why, you know, I'm so thankful for our sponsor, BetterHelp. Being able to sit down with a therapist and have someone to be able to provide language to your problem is so amazing. If you've never been able to experience that, I'm telling you, it is one of the best feelings in the world because it's almost like you have these feelings that you've been that you've you've had for years, but you've never been able to put the right words to them. You've never been able to put the right language to them and to have somebody to come and add that language to to how you've been feeling is is absolutely amazing. And you're trying to figure out all these different ways to resolve how you feel and to find enough solutions. And you finally come to the conclusion that everything that I've been thinking about me trying to do, it's not, I I, I have, I have, I don't, I don't have all of the equipment. And sometimes what you need to do is you need to get the the right tools so that when you, when you encounter certain situations, you know exactly what to do. It's like, you know, if you're, if you're, if something happens with your car, you want to have the right tools inside of your car because you have to change your tire. Like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, if, if my tire is blown out, I don't want to have a blowtorch. That's not going to help me change my tire. And I want to make sure I have the right tools and better help provides you with those right tools because it gives you a host of therapists that you can choose from. It is, it is affordable. It's accessible. It's convenient. And it's entirely online. So you know, we're about sitting inside of an office, all that kind of stuff. I'm telling you, if you've ever thought about giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is the best option. It is the best option. And right now, if you reached out, you fill out a brief survey and you can get matched up with a therapist. And you may be saying, well, what if I don't like my therapist? Well, great. Switch up therapists. I do that all the time. I'm like, no, nah, me and you, we don't click. I need to, I need to find somebody else because you ain't, you, ain't, you ain't giving me the right tools that I need to be able to handle the situations I find myself in. So right now, I want you to take that time to reach out to BetterHelp. You do that by going to betterhelp.com slash lenses. That is betterhelp.com slash lenses. And you'll get 10% off your first month, y'all. So that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash lenses, L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-S. Again, that is betterhelp. H E L P dot com slash Lindsay's get the help that you, that you need and get the help because I mean, and I, I've had to have this conversation with my therapist and that conversation centered around the fact that I just did not feel like I was good enough. And one of the things that, that she and I did is we took a journey. Uh, we took a journey back to, you know, you know, just my level of understanding how I was introduced to my Christian faith. And then the, the words that I kind of heard through my Christian faith. And then the way that I was kind of introduced to God, because how we are typically introduced to God is how we share him with others. I never felt like I was enough because I always saw God like I saw a dad. I always saw God like I need to do more to prove that I'm worthy enough to be his son. I need to do more because I don't feel accepted. I don't feel loved. And then any, you know, the smallest infraction or the smallest consequence, I would almost use it as evidence to validate the fact that I'm not good enough. And one of the reasons for that is because I had, I had this, this pathway. If you, if you, if you think of your mind, I want you to think about like all these different highways and interstates. And I had developed this pathway, this neural pathway in my mind of thinking. And this pathway led me down this dark road that ultimately put me in a state of depression because I just did not feel like I was enough. and I didn't feel like I belonged. And that pathway for me, it started at the place of sin. Because, well, it really started at the place of, okay, God, I don't think I'm good enough. And then even when I would hear people say, yeah, but you're not good enough. And I would preach this. I would say, yeah, you're not good enough. That's the reason why you sent Christ. 
but I didn't, I, you know, and I'm going to say this out loud because I feel like I need to, I feel like somebody needs to hear this. I'm just going to say it. Even though I said, yeah, you know, Jesus is enough. I didn't believe it because, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Jesus is enough. But if I really believed that he was enough, then I wouldn't keep trying to prove myself to earn more brownie points from you. So I still didn't feel like he was enough. Yes, I said it with my mouth, but it wasn't really something I really believed in my heart. So right there, it's like, you know, God and I were just at odds. Like, are you sure you love me? Or do I need to do more for you to love me? If I write more books, if I go preach more places, if I go do more things, then will you love me? And so I never really settled into sonship. And I, I just, I couldn't settle into sonship because I didn't even feel like a son in my, in my natural relationship with my father. And when you hear this, I want you to understand that there is, a, there is an extremely strong significance with natural and spiritual. I know a lot of times in, you know, in religion, we want to do away with the natural and we just want to call it worldly. You know, that's just of the flesh. But there is a lot of truth to the idea that how we experience our father, it will ultimately bleed over into how we see God. We live a very natural life. And I feel like, you know, religion almost, it, it, it dispels the argument that we are supposed to be human. But isn't that what Jesus is? Wasn't that part of Jesus's message and method? Notice that, you know, in, in all four of the recounts of the gospel, notice how they spoke about Jesus. Not one time did Jesus say, refer to me as God. Even though he lived in a state of duality, which we all do. He lived in a state of duality because Jesus was both man and God. You know, when, when, we, when we think about God, God is, God is one and three. You know, think about Mary. Mary is both a virgin and pregnant. Think about, you know, mankind. Think about us. We are, we, we are one and three. We, we, live, we, live in a, we live in a place of duality. But because, because of how religion is, it, it focuses more on the law. It focuses more on the law and it focuses more on the rules. And so it, it, it's almost like it's devoid of humanity. So where there is sin, there are just consequences. So because I didn't feel like I was enough for God and I, didn't, I wasn't enough you know, for my natural father, then it brought on the sin, which brought on consequences. So then it kept me in the, so I stayed in the dark to try to hide you know, my sin, which then ultimately brought on more consequences. And, you know, with, with sin, it brings forth what punishment, as we know that, you know, temptation gives birth to to sin and then sin brings forth what death. And so it went sin and then it went punishment. And then with punishment came what shame and ridicule. So now let's shame you for your punishment. Because for some reason, we still believe that shame and ridicule is going to somehow assist someone in or out of their sin. We think that somehow shame and ridicule is going to be the thing that's going to help to turn them towards repentance, which is that was never that's that's not even a biblical interpretation at all. I mean, that's what, you know, a lot of cancel culture is all about. That's it's a lot of finger pointing. It's it's all about how can we shame you in your punishment? you know, that's devoid of duality, being able to both admit you are wrong and there's a problem. And if we go back to what I talked about last time, it, for myself, I had to live in a, in a place of duality that I am both wrong and I'm unconscious, which in my, in my, in my state of unconsciousness, I make decisions that are not in the best interest for myself and those around me. But because of sin, you have punishment, and then with punishment comes shame and ridicule, and then oftentimes with religion, not only just comes with shame and ridicule, but then it also comes with you know removal, because a lot of religion is about perspective. It, it it it's about it's about you know it's about image. So now I cannot be seen with you 
or I cannot be seen around you. Or I cannot be seen talking to you because somehow because of your humanity is going to somehow, you know, ruin my image because people are going to see me with you. It's the same way when Jesus, when they came up to when the, when the Pharisees came to Jesus and or they came to Levi's house and Jesus was sitting there and he's sitting there with, with tax collectors and all the people. And the, and the first is like, who, 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 who? How, why is he sitting with them? Why is he sitting with humanity? Religion sits back and says, why is he with them? But humanity says, I need him to sit with me. And Jesus made a point in all of the depictions of Jesus. He made a point to point us towards our humanity because that is always what he pointed himself towards. Humanity, 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 humanity. You were human. You were human. You were human. You were human. I came here to show you that there, is a, that there is another way. And I also came here to be the way because I know that you can't do it yourself because you are human, which is why I'm willing to sit down with humanity. I'm willing to take on your experience. I'm willing to live in your duality. I'm willing to, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to show you this, which is also why Jesus did not tell anyone to worship him. He said to follow me because we don't worship humanism. We don't worship humanity. And Jesus always pointed towards his humanity, although we understand his divinity. It was always his humanity. And that's what he was pointing us towards. So then sin brings forth this sense of punishment, which then invites, you know, shame, ridicule. And then our expectation is that somehow with all of that is going to bring about repentance. And if we can be honest, that's just not the way it works at all. It's just not the way it works at all. We want, we, want, we want it to be that way, but it's not the way it works at all. So we just walked back in the house, and how amazing is it that sitting at the front door was the HelloFresh box? Let me tell you all something. You know, with HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh pre-proportioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. No more thinking and hassling about, oh my goodness, what am I going to cook? What do I go to the grocery store? Do I have to pick this up? All those different things. No more of that. You can skip trips to the grocery store. You can count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun. And here's the other great thing, affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. You can subscribe to HelloFresh and check save money off your fall to-do list. HelloFresh is 25% cheaper than takeout and less expensive than grocery shopping, too. You know, my family of five, we all have different you know, eating patterns. I'm a carnivore. My wife is a vegan. My oldest son is a carnivore. My other two kids are vegetarians. HelloFresh is convenient for the entire family. They provide options for the entire family. HelloFresh is now offering vegan recipes on the menu every week made without animal products of any kind like dairy, meat, eggs, or honey, which is great for my wife. You can get meals like sweet chili tofu bowls or spicy coconut curry stir fry. You can get all that vegan stuff. But if you want to eat some meat like me, you can always count on some good pieces of chicken and some steak. I mean, it's going to be some good stuff in there. You know what I'm talking about? We love HelloFresh. So go to HelloFresh.com slash LWL65 and use code LWL65 for 65% off plus free shipping. Y'all go to HelloFresh.com slash LWL65 and use code LWL65 for 65% off plus free shipping. You can't beat that. HelloFresh.com slash LWL65. Y'all, you getting 65% off plus free shipping? Yo, this is why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. Well, because of the way that I thought, I had, okay, God, I'm already not good enough for you because I don't feel like I've been good enough. I don't feel like I ever live up to a certain standard be good enough for my natural father. And because of that, every wrong thing that I do, I focus in on my punishment. And it's almost as if I deserve, I know that I deserve my punishment because I know I'm not good enough. But I have to live with a public persona that shows people that I am good enough. Where I'm trying to do things to prove that I am good enough because I have to live in a state of performance. And hopefully that the performance would somehow negate the fact that I, that I have to experience punishment. 
But then when the punishment is heightened, then it brings up shame, ridicule, and then oftentimes pushes you away from the very people who, you know, you would think would love you. You know, it's, it's like the, the young girl who, um, you know, walks inside the church and she's pregnant without a wedding ring on. And then the pastor's wife walks up to her and says, where's your husband? And she says, I don't have one. And she says, well, why are you pregnant? And she says, well, I had, I had sex and I had a baby. And the pastor's wife says, you can't be here at this church. You're in sin. So they kick her out of the church. And if you think that this is just a fantasy that I'm telling you about, this is reality. This is what religion does. Because it says that somehow in your shame and your ridicule and being an outcast, that punishment is going to ultimately lead you to repentance. And then through repentance, you'll possibly get some sense of transformation prayerfully because you're going to be transformed. Why? Because you have been shamed and ridiculed enough. And I had to change the way I thought because the way that I thought was keeping me bound. I had to recognize something that sin is a very, very real thing. But again, I had to live in that duality of knowing in my, in my humanism, I am going to miss the mark. And I do miss the mark. And I have missed the mark. And I will in the future miss the mark. But in missing the mark, that does not mean that I am just this completely horrible person that I try to make myself out to be. Because the duality is, yes, you are human. And, and yes, you are completely responsible for your actions. That is absolutely correct. You are completely responsible for your actions. And on the other side of it, my actions are born out of a sense of unconsciousness. Because I am not conscious. I'm not, I'm not aware. I'm not sober enough to be able to see how my actions and my activity has affected not only myself, but has affected those around me. So I had to change my, my mindset and go back to God and say, okay, God, I'm not doing anything else to try to prove myself to you. And if me being me is not enough, then I don't know what else to give you. And arriving at that place and realizing that me being me, just me breathing is enough for me to accept his love. I don't have to do anything else for him to be approved or to be accepting of me because I'm simply breathing that he loves me. And because I, I begin, and I'm, I'm, I'm in this process now, really diving deep into that, I still see sin exactly how the Bible does, uh, designs for us to see it. But now it is not as heightened as it once was. Because I know that where there is sin, the next, form, the next, the next part of the pathway is not punishment but rather it is unconditional love. You know, for some people that can be very difficult to hear because you'll think, no, brother, no, you need to be punished. And I get it. But the reason why unconditional love comes after the sin, I'll, 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 I'll take it back to the scripture. You came to know of Christ well, I would hope that you came to know of Christ by his love. It, it, it's, a, it's a whole lot easier to run into the arms of a loving father than it is to run into the arms of a slave master who's there to beat you and punish you and condemn you and sentence you to hell. It is much, much better to run into the eye, to run into the arms of a loving father. So the reason why God designed it this way is he says, listen, I know you're human. Now I want you to come and run into my arms. And then you say, well, yeah, but Cornelius, there's still punishment. Yeah, but we don't look at it as punishment. We look at it as, we look at it as restoration. We look at it as a sense of restitution. If you go back, and I think I talked about this on one of the, uh, one of the talks, but if you go back and you look at uh, King David, King David had uh, one of his soldiers killed Uriah, put him out on the front line, had him killed, and then King David took his wife, uh, took Uriah's wife, uh, Bathsheba and um, basically you know, committed adultery, uh, slept with Bathsheba, got her pregnant, and she was going to have a son. 
And God sent Nathan, a prophet, to go and confront him, uh, which is so important in and of itself. I, I, think, I think even that teaching itself needs to be talked about a lot more. I think it would, it would provide uh, people with very clear understanding that, you know, just because you have a word or just because, just because you, you have a leader's ear does not mean that you have authority, you know, to be able to speak, you know, to be able to, to, to be able to provide correction. And I think that may be difficult for a lot of people to hear because your assumption is that your words carry weight and they do, but God is also a God of order. and a king looked in the eyes of a prophet. It's a reason why David, it's a reason why God didn't send one of David's generals to confront him because David could have just sent him back to the front line and had him killed. You know, it's, there, there's, there's a reason why there, there's a, there's a big reason why like I would have to tell people often, like when I was on social media and people had a way of getting contact with me and they would send me, you know, rebukes and all that kind of stuff. And I would tell them, well, you know, I have a pastor <laughs> and if I don't have relationship with you, so I don't respect your words. The people who I have relationship with are the people who I submit to. And so I respect their words and not yours. I don't respect the words of a stranger. And even though you could, you can consider Nathan a, a stranger, Nathan had the type of authority to be able to speak, you know, directly to David. And which is, which is, you know, so important, which is so, 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 so important. But Nathan comes, he confronts David. David admits, I am the man. I did exactly what you're saying. I am wrong. This, this, everything you're saying is absolutely correct. I am wrong. And then he asks for God to forgive him. God, you know, God forgives him. But then right after that, God says, yeah, but your son's going to die. I hear what you're saying, buddy, but your son's going to die. And David, you know, mourns and weeps, you know, praying to God, God, do not kill my son. God, do not kill my son. But ultimately David's son dies. I had a hard time with that because I sat back with that and I was like, you know, God, I mean, did you have to kill his son? I mean, could you have forgiven him and allowed for him to still have his son? And you could look at that. And you could say, well, no, he couldn't because David needed to be punished because of his sin. But I don't look at it as punishment. I look at that as God's love. Because God was saying, David, I cannot let your son live. Because your son, as great as, as he could have potentially been, your son is not part of your plan towards restitution. Your son is not part of the plan towards restoration. And I'll allow for you to have another son. You can have Solomon, but this one cannot live. This one cannot live. I mean, I mean, heck, if we went back to Abraham and, and Sarah or Abraham and, and Hagar, you know, the, the, the maid, you know, Abraham slept with his, with his maid, slept with Hagar, and he had Ishmael. And then, you know, but God had promised him a child through Sarah. He sleeps, you know, gets with Sarah, and then Sarah finally has a child, Isaac. And if, you know, if, if, if that child, if Ishmael would not have been born, then, you know, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have a lot of the problems that we have right now over the, you know, over the seas and over the waters or all over the world, because we still have, we still have the blood of Ishmael that is still running wild right now. And if you know your Bible and all that kind of stuff, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But God was saying, listen, this is out of my love. I'm not taking, I'm not taking any pleasure out of seeing you hurt. I'm not taking any pleasure out of seeing you in pain. I'm not taking any pleasure by doing this. This is out of my love. This is an act of, this is an act of restoration. This is an act of restitution. And it's something that you have to take, that you have to take part in. So I, in this new frame of thinking, I'm looking and say, okay, God, you know, I see who you are. I see what sin is. I see your unconditional love comes into play. I'm no longer seeing it as you punishing me, but I see this as you restoring me. And with restoration, that means that I have to do away with some of the old in order for me to have the new. In order for you to restore me, you have to put me back into right order. And you cannot put me back into right order with, with old baggage. If I'm going to go into something new, then I can't go into something new with that which is old. If I'm going to experience the new wineskin, then I don't I don't want to continue to pour old, uh, you know, old wine in it. So now I see this act as unconditional love. But out of this unconditional love, I also have a very real humanistic sense of guilt, which I think is extremely healthy. Because guilt allows for you to see what you have done and then to be repentant over it. 
The reason why I think guilt is so great outside of shame is because shame, shame comes in to mess with your identity. Shame says you're not enough. Shame says, you know, it doesn't matter what you did because you're a bad person. Guilt says I did a bad thing. Shame says you're a bad person. You're not enough. Shame says, oh, you're more than enough, but you definitely did a bad thing. Do you see the duality in this? The duality, the and instead of the or. Shame is all about or. Shame is about the fact that, oh, you did a bad thing. You're a bad person. But guilt comes in and guilt says, listen, you're an amazing person. You're human. You did a bad thing. You did a bad thing. But because of the unconditional love, now I can really experience transformation. And this is where pure transformation comes from. And then transformation is what leads to repentance. Instead of repentance leading to transformation, transformation leads to repentance. Then that repentance is leading to forgiveness for myself and for others. Y'all hear that? Repentance for myself. And I'm repenting, but I'm forgiven. I'm in a place of forgiveness now. And that forgiveness is coming out of myself and others. Instead of me just, you know, thinking sin, punishment, which includes shame, ridicule, and, you know, oftentimes, you know, being an outcast and then repentance and transformation, while there's still unforgiveness in my heart because I can't forgive the person who I can't forget the person who hurt me. But all the time you have to recognize that the person that hurt you is human. And if your pathway if the way you think about sin and all that stuff, if it is born out of the fact that this person is bad and that, you know, God is going to just punish everybody and everybody should be punished for their sin. Everybody should, everybody should be punished. Everybody should be punished. Everybody should be punished. Then of course you won't have any forgiveness for yourself and for others because you're going to believe that you are, that you are worthy of all of your punishment. And you're going to be- believe that everybody else is worthy of theirs too. Everyone deserves to die. Because his or her offenses. You show me a perfect person. One doesn't exist. One thing I know is that God loves us so much. If you look at John 3.16, what does it say? For God so loved the world. Now, in alignment with what I'm talking about here, God loves us so much, for God so loved the world, that he restored the pathway to eternal life through Jesus Christ. which is who he tells us to, we get it from Luke chapter 637, to forgive and it shall be forgiven. Forgive and it shall be forgiven. And then from Matthew 615 tells us that our refusal to forgive, that it stops us that forgiveness from God for us. Why? Because forgiveness returns to God the right to take care of justice. Deuteronomy 32, 35, we talk about all the time. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Forgiveness says, I'm going to return to God the right to take care of justice. Because I am not going to be responsible for the justice I think somebody else is owed. Because when I think about their punishment, or I think about their pathway of restoration and restitution. I pray they, they, that they are gifted as much grace and mercy as I pray that I'm gifted for my own wrongdoing. That's a pathway. A pathway you have to create for yourself. A pathway that will lead you toward true healing. A pathway that won't stop you in your tracks and make you think that you are worthless and you are nothing but a pathway that says you are enough. You have what it takes. God loves you so much. And like I said earlier, it is a lot easier for you to run into the arms of a loving father than it is for you to run into the arms of a punishable, mean, angry father. Our God is the loving one. He sees you afar off and he opens up his arms ready to embrace you. And he has his best robe ready to put around your shoulder. And he's ready to put the ring 
back on your finger. Do you deserve any of it? Heck no. But that's the love that he has for you. And it is that kind of love that brings transformation. And it's that kind of love that brings repentance. And it's that kind of love that breeds forgiveness in yourself and in others. Y'all, this is life. We're living it the best way we possibly can. In a dual sense. In both our humanity and our deity. God bless y'all. Talk to y'all next week.